My name is Jill Phillips and I'm the creator of Who's Shoes, a popular approach to co-production. I was named as an HSJ100 wildcard and want to help give a voice to others, talking about their experiences and ideas. I love chatting with people from all sorts of different perspectives, walking in their shoes. If you are interested in the future of healthcare and like to hear what other people think, or perhaps even contribute at some point, Wildcard Who Shoes is for you. So today is the first episode of this special mini podcast series in collaboration with London South Bank University and the Universal Healthcare Network. Hang on, Jill, I hear you say. We've already heard you talking to Professor Becky Melby about this. And you're right. I recorded a special episode with Becky as a bookend to introduce this series and tell you why universal healthcare is important, so that we can dive right into these conversations and hear what the various special guests have been doing to make universal healthcare a reality. And today, I'm not only talking to someone I know, but a friend of mine who I've been wanting to get on the podcast for a very long time. It's my huge pleasure to introduce Tom Holliday, a very forward-thinking consultant paediatrician and also now leading the Darcy Fellowship Programme with which I work closely every year with Who's Shoes. So, a provocative title for this first conversation today, Children Get Less. So we're flipping things and putting children and young people first here. After all, they are our future. So, Tom, how should we dive into this important topic and make it make sense to our listeners? Who are you and what are you up to? Brilliant. Thanks, Jill. Um, it's a real honour to be here. As you know, I'm always such a fan of everything you do. So, uh, you know, it's a real pleasure to, to be invited onto your podcast. So, yeah, my name's Dr. Tom Holliday. I'm, I'm a consultant paediatrician. I work at London Northwest University Healthcare Trust. I've been there as a consultant about three, four years now, um, and I'm the integrated care lead there. That said, I'd always worked in West London and Ealing and Northwick Park for almost all of my paediatric training. So I know the region, I feel very at home there. And people often ask me what my speciality is. I always say I don't, I don't really have a speciality. I'm a generalist, I'm like a hyper generalist. And yeah, my role in integrated care is really going out and joining up parts of the system. And sometimes we say integrated care, but I think really it's about defragmenting care because we've split that care up a lot over the, well, over the lifetime of the NHS. And then my other job is, as you mentioned, I work at London South Bank University and I'm an associate professor there in clinical leadership and health system innovation. And it's a real privilege to be the director of the Darcy Fellowship in clinical leadership there. That's amazing, Tom. Thanks for that introduction and uh, integrated care lead. Wow, that's a big, big ask, isn't it? Because <laughs> I, th I think, you know, I'm doing a project that I'm rather proud of at the moment with Midlands Partnership Foundation Trust. And that is the holy grail, isn't it? Joining things up for families. They don't really care who provides this service or that service they just know they've got a child with possibly complex needs who needs help and they want that service to join up around the child and indeed the family and that's why I'm excited to be talking to you because I think that's exactly what you're doing and some really innovative ways of doing that yes yeah yeah I hope so I think it's very different because you know we say it's uh, innovations in care and I think lots of the time when people talk about innovations in care you know they think about sort of like health tech and you know robotics and uh, things that sound like very you know cutting edge stuff virtual wards but i think this is a very different and actually in some ways a, a much more necessary you know form of innovation it's actually how we organize care in a way that better meets the need of you know both the people who are accessing the care and also also the people providing the care in uh, in lots of cases and yeah it's, it's a real honor to be integrated care lead it's, it's what i'm i'm trained in it's what my experience is in and the funny thing is I often I often find it quite a, a difficult term though, because I think, you know, first of all, integrated care, the whole point of that is that it's much more patient centred and population centred care. It's a, it's a way to better address need, first and foremost. I always think if it's a, if it's such a patient centred um, idea, then the, the word integrated care 
it's very it sounds very jargony very <laughs> um, and lots of people don't really know what it is and then the other thing that i think is always that you know we say integrated care and you know i'm the integrated care lead and it makes it seem like it's a, a special thing or you know something extra or like cardiology or respiratory and it's not it's i was just think it's it's a term for what we should be doing anyway we should be joining up the system providing more connective care it's just a term for well best practice care really but uh, i think the risk is always if you say it's integrated care this is our integrated care system this is our integrated care pathway this is our integrated care lead then it just makes it seem like another speciality but it's not i think it's like it's hyper generalism that, that's the point it's defragmenting to provide better care that's a really good word i think defragmenting and i think you said then that it's important equally for staff, you said for people providing the care to, and I know when we spoke before as a sort of pre-chat, Tom, I wrote down this quote that you'd said, I want to be able to meet need in a way that the system doesn't interfere with, as a driving oh thing for good staff coming into the system. And you know, how huge is that really, that, that the system doesn't interfere with? And, and that's the... The golden thread, really, isn't it? To try and actually join things up in a way that's just common sense without it all being overcomplicated. Gosh. Um, <laughs> Do you remember that nugget? Did I, did, I, did I say that? Did I say that, Jill? <laughs> you did, you did. <laughs> <laughs> I was impressed. Were you? I was. <laughs> Gosh, I don't know. I'm wondering to what extent it's possible to ever um, do that without the system interfering because whatever system you have is still a system, isn't it? Yeah. I guess uh, I guess when we were talking, we were speaking a little bit about how the system has become quite siloed and quite fragmented. And very often what that means is that for you know families, young people, populations who are trying to access care, they have to go to where the care is provided. Yes. They have to go to the organisations because you know, people often do ask me, you know, what is integrated care then? I normally start with what integrated care isn't, which is more or less a system we've currently got where the care is tied to organisations and really those organisations most often than not are sort of bricks and mortar buildings. Sometimes they're virtual buildings these days post-pandemic but more often than not you know those are buildings and organisations and to access the care provided by that organisation the family has to cross that boundary to get the care there. So that might mean they have to go to the GP to be seen then they might be sent to the hospital to that organisation and then there's a wait there and then the hospital might send them on to see another specialist or to see a community provider. And every time you're moving on to another service, you're losing information down the gap there. Mm. The information that you lose is, is the context of the family and the story and the narrative. So it means that you can't see the pattern. You can't really work on addressing that need. So I always think that integrated care is really just reconnecting lots of those people and those, those relationships, really. And I think what it implies is that instead of making the families come to you, we actually have to think about leaving our organisations and building the care more around them, making it much more patient-centred and working together. You know, it implies collaboration, it's built in. So really these days when people ask me what integrated care is, I, my standard answer is that it's about relationships. Relationships, yeah. Yeah, it's about relationships. That's the centre, that's what really makes it work. My standard answer to, you know, can I give a definition of integrated care these days is that it's about building relationships across a care boundary that's focused on meeting the needs of a patient or a patient group. Yeah. Because it's the relationships that really change the outcome. It's, that's what makes it work. Listening to you talking there, Tom, I mean, I know that access is a key theme of the Universal Healthcare National Inquiry. So that's going to be running across these various mini podcasts that we're doing across different areas of the service. But an example, I'm actually finalising at the moment some new Who Shoes scenarios around children in care, and we've actually got a scenario called Falling Through the Cracks, and I'm discovering different levels of layers and layers of this oh, stuff, yeah. so that, for example, if a child in care moves, you, you think it must be a big move in a child's life to move to a new foster family, perhaps it involves moving to a new school... But as soon as, as I understand it, involves going to a different GP, they might need to be re-referred for, say, CAM support, and they might have CAM support that's going really well for them, and suddenly the whole thing gets disrupted, and even they might drop to the, the back of a waiting list yeah. again somewhere else. 
Oh my goodness. Yeah, it's um, it's madness, isn't it? It is madness. Yeah, and, and you can only imagine what that's like. Um, and actually, you know, the thing is, Jill, it's inefficient, isn't it? The system's set up the way it is because there is a notion that it's more efficient. And um, it depends what you measure, really, because if you measure activity, which is what the NHS does measure, if you measure activity and you measure stuff, the stuff that we do, then actually it is very efficient because we do a lot of stuff for a lot of money. But in a much wider sense, it's hugely inefficient because every time you are creating a new waiting list, every time you're going back through triage, you're adding in a step and uh, you're creating more demand for the system. And we know that the problem is if you design a system around demand and creating capacity to meet demand, then actually it's very well, it's very well known that demand overall is only ever going to go up. It's built in. It's designed into the system. The insustainability of the current system is, is designed in. We organise around capacity and demand. Demand goes up. We incentivize activity. So, of course, you know, in a complex system, you get what you pay attention to. If, if you incentivize act- activity, if you incentivize doing stuff, you're going to get more stuff, right? More stuff to do. And then <laughs> we wonder why we can't do it all <laughs> with the resources yeah. we've got. It's absolutely built in. So... The answer for for me in lots of these cases is that you don't organise around demand, you organise around meeting need. Because if you're meeting need, it's quite simple, the overall level of need goes down. And the sooner you can do that by promoting access, if you can promote access, then the sooner you can meet need closer to where people live and work, the overall need goes down and you get a much more sustainable system, you get a much happier, healthier population. And in general, you get much um, happier, healthier staff to do that with. So, yeah, I agree with you. I mean, it's such a win-win, isn't it? And I know yeah. you were talking about relationships, and that's key, isn't it? Absolutely mm. key. And the example that I came in and gave immediately smashes relationships. Someone started to, especially yeah. children perhaps in care, who've got absolutely understandably issues around trust and attachment and they start to get to know somebody and start to trust them how damaging yeah. to smash that yeah. relationship yeah no i agree i think that the issue is the relationships designed out in that system aren't they like the minute you've got multiple silos and fragmented care you've designed out relationships and you're absolutely right Jill. especially if you've got children families in the care system who probably in some cases have, have known very few stable, sustainable relationships. Yes. And you can see why that doesn't work and why that's not a good quality system of care for those people. And I think funding, again, I'm sure that comes up in the Universal Healthcare National Inquiry, the idea of people having sustainable funding so that you're not limping along from one contract to the next and again relationships if you know that you're going to be able to work with a child for as long as it takes rather than wondering whether the number of sessions that have been commissioned or the block of funding to our community organization might end in march it's all of these things isn't it because not only does that in itself stop things but just the worry about it and the fact that people's attention is distracted to other things rather than just the relationship and helping the child no i agree i agree and you know i think actually even then you can still bring that back to its effect on the relationships that it has because if you have short-term funding you get short-term relationships yes they don't mature they get broken and relationships don't develop overnight there's this lovely um saying that change happens at the speed relationships form yes so you need longevity so all of those things like resource funding estates personnel you need longer timelines and they facilitate a much more robust, resilient relational system if you've got them in place. So, Tom, perhaps tell us a bit more about your work in this context with children in London, which I find really innovative and how other people might learn from this in some way. So I guess the first thing to say is that they are things other people can do elsewhere and Actually, that's that's why we're doing them. I think in the NHS, there's nothing new under the sun. Yes. 
And yeah, when we talk about innovation in the NHS, very often, yeah, what does that actually mean? Because it's chances are it's been tried somewhere. And I always think as um, innovation is new to that context, to that time or place. Yes. Because the thing that you can't move is, you know, we've spoken about this a lot. The thing that you can't move is the relationships. So every time you're trying to set up a new integrated initiative, um, you're starting from scratch, really. It's a new complex change program and it, it evolves in unpredictable ways. I think if you if you can do it right, it evolves in a way that is much more suitable and suited to its context. So there's a little bit of variation there, but it's hopefully warranted variation so that it fits much more within what's needed in that place. But yeah, so two two examples, and both examples are um, from uh, my work. I say my work, but it's our work. It's a team effort. You can't do this on its own. Our work at London Northwest in trying to promote a more integrated, joined up experience for our populations of young people around the hospital. Our, our context at London Northwest is that we have a very diverse population. It's a very wide catchment area. In fact, we look after more than 10% of all of London's young people. Really? Wow. Hundreds of thousands of young people. And between our various sites, so we have Northwick Park, Central Middlesex and, and Ealing, we cover a huge part of Northwest London. A really diverse group, lots of different languages, lots of areas of deprivation, very low levels of health education in some of those uh, some of those populations. So you know, you're thinking about universal health. We look after twelve percent of London's paediatric population. What we know, it doesn't matter really where you look. We know that those groups don't access primary care as much. I mean, in fact, if you look at the Universal Health Inquiry, I think the figure is that GP populations, the under 25 year group, make up about 16% of your average GP population, but they only use about 10% of primary care resources. So they're underrepresented in primary care. Big difference, yeah. And it's a huge difference. And if you if you look at, therefore, where they're going, because they still got needs, they might look a bit different to adult needs, but they're still needs, very often tied up with their family's needs. If you look at any sort of local secondary care A&E, chances are that they're, they're turning up there. Because we know that A&E attendance for those groups is proportionally higher. Right. And in fact, your under fives, wherever you look, are very often your single largest number of attendances to A and E, and very often the under fives, they're also the group who are one of the most likely groups to leave A and E with a diagnosis of um, nothing abnormal detected, or simple issues that could be seen and sorted in in primary care. Right. So the answer really is, you know, in my book, is um, you know working together to provide more robust care in primary care that better meets their needs there. You can look at sort of high-performing healthcare systems around the world and almost without fail, there isn't a high-performing healthcare system that doesn't in some way work to strengthen or have robust primary healthcare. It's, it's so essential. And so it's really tied into this idea of universal healthcare provision. So the question really is, how can you meet more need and do more of the right care, right place, right time in, in primary care? For, uh, for young people. So the way that we've done that, we, we use a model called um, Child Health Hubs. Um, you know, it's very, very much not our model. A lot of my um, people who I'm very, you know, privileged to be able to call colleagues now, like my colleagues at uh, Imperial, you know, Mando Watson, Bob Kleber, our neighbours in, uh, in Hillingdon, um, to the west of us, uh, we're working on similar models for, over 10 years now. So we were relatively late adopters, but we've had some success. And the idea is that there's a, there's a whole proportion of, of issues that will come to us at the hospital, normally to outpatients, that actually could be seen and treated just in primary care with a bit more joined up working between uh, the GPs, the primary care teams and, and the paediatricians. Right. They've done uh, quite a few audits and studies of this now, uh, where they've sat GPs and paediatricians down to look at referrals that come into secondary care paediatrics. And it's thought that about 20 to 40% of those 
could be managed in primary care with a bit of extra support. Right. So, you know, it's about a third of all referrals. It's huge. Yeah. yeah, it's huge, isn't it? It's relatively replicable across across the patch. So the idea is how, how can you do that? So uh, what we do is, uh, yeah, we have a system called Child Health Hubs and we run monthly joint clinics. So you have a, a paediatrician and a, a GP and those clinics run at a PCN level. So they're a place-based initiative. And the paediatrician who's allocated to that PCN... Primary care networks. We have an acronym and alert. Uh, primary care networks. Yes, yeah, yeah. Primary care networks, of course. Yeah, too many TLAs, Jill. <laughs> Three-letter three acronyms. That's the one. Yeah, do catch me up. <laughs> so yeah, the paediatrician who's allocated to uh, that PCN stays as the uh, link paediatrician. So that way they build up the relationship over the patch and that becomes that that patch, that place. So we provide both, um, it's some integration terminology for you. We provide both vertical integration, which is integration across care levels. So primary, secondary, tertiary care. Um, You know, I, I still think it's important to think about the words and actually hierarchy is even implied in that, isn't it? We say primary, secondary, tertiary care. Yes, it is, yeah. But it's the terminology we've got. Yeah. So you have uh, vertical integration across care levels provided by a joint clinic. And then we also provide a, a monthly MDT. So what's an MDT? A multidisciplinary <laughs> meeting. There we go. Which provides uh, um, horizontal integration across services. And the joy of doing this at the moment is that these days you can do that as a virtual MDT. So uh, there we will invite in, for example, um, you know, you'll have your paediatrician, the GP. We'll have people from CAMS. CAMS professionals will come. Local authority, uh, the school nurses, the therapists will come. Our community paediatrics colleagues will come. Very often we have commissioning colleagues there. And, and of course, GPs from the primary care network will join as well. And so in, in that way, we can work on actually quite complex issues where you know patients young people are stuck and very often as a result of a fragmented system because that need can't be met by any one of those services working in isolation exactly it's really wonderful you know what the thing is it's it's not rocket science is it it's not no you just get all the people in the room um but you can see it working yeah you know, i ran one yesterday um we had our monthly meeting for sphere pcn in harrow i'm the link pediatrician there we had our monthly meeting yesterday and you can see it working Sometimes you get simple clinical queries that actually, you know, normally you might put through advice and guidance. You might get a reply in a few days. I can, I can answer that. Right up to much more complex stuff where there's a, a social services need, a schooling need, you know, a primary, secondary care need, a mental health need. But you've got all of those professionals in the room. So you're joining up the system providing much better access for that young person and you are hopefully unsticking something for them somewhere in the system and getting everyone on the same page. I think it's brilliant Tom I can actually hear the people that I work with you know the parents of of children with perhaps complex needs just going yes 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 it's just what people are crying out for really because you know you flip it and people have got an appointment here and an appointment there and they're spending half their time telling their story to somebody new and trying to explain what happened last week. Does that make it different or is that more of the same or just trying to join things up? Whereas you're getting the professionals together for the children and families and listening. Yeah. Well, no, um, I think that's exactly it, Joe. And, you know, I was, I was speaking to some of my colleagues from that meeting yesterday. And um, if we go back to our point about integrated care is about relationships and relationships between professionals and between organizations centered on meeting need there's the direct benefit of the discussion you have in that multidisciplinary team meeting to that patient being discussed but there is a much much wider more long-term benefit that you get for free because of the um the lasting relationships that have formed over the time we've done that we've been running that mdt for about two years now and if i need a school nurse for a patient I've seen in my clinic, I will just email my friends, the school nurses in Harrow. If I need CAMS advice, I can just email the CAMS team. It's brilliant. If I'm stuck and I need the therapy services, an OT physio, I can send them a quick message and say, and and likewise, they will do the same for me. 
and and that's built in you get that for free yeah whereas before you know if i if i needed a school nurse before my goodness i wouldn't have had the faintest idea to start but it it, it joins up care if i see someone who i'm worried about in my um, pediatric clinic i think oh let's choose a patient you know if, if, if i've got like a a nine-year-old with asthma that I'm a little bit worried about, um, I might not see them very often. And in fact, the the total time that I might see them across a year, even if I see them, you know, three times, four times a year, probably adds up to about an hour in total actual contact time. Yes. And I'm, if I think, oh, I need someone to uh, to check in on them and actually in that context, in that place, I can just message the school nurses and say, would you mind just like seeing how they are? And they'll, they'll report back to me and we join up care that way. Uh, it's a much more, you know, person-centered, relational way of doing things. And it feels, it feels much nicer to work in that way as well. You know, you're not an island. You're not there, you know, banging your head against the wall, fighting the system to do your best for the patient. You can, you can do that because you've got the relationships with the people who, who are there to help you. It's, it's nice. <laughs> it feels much better. Yeah, I'm sure everyone appreciates that. That's yeah. really nice. Like, yeah. you know, I know you said to be on first name terms with people rather than just like a phone number. Yeah. Or, yeah, it's such a difference. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You are on first name. You know, we are on first name terms. I didn't give their yeah. names because I didn't want to embarrass any of them in this chat. No, but, no, uh, sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and then aren't you going a step beyond that as well or a different yeah. aspect joining up? Mm. Oh, my goodness. Oh my. Physical health and mental health. <laughs> Haven't you got an equivalent kind of? joint no, we, approach we have we have um i wonder jill actually if you want to hear some of um because i know we were talking about Im improving access and uh strengthening primary care and I, I i wondered if it might be useful to briefly tell you some of the results of our our local evaluation on that brilliant yes please yeah because we, we've got some um some data from our evaluation of our pilot which ran for about 18 months you know i think probably one of the important things to say is that one of the unique things about working for the NHS is whenever you try and do a, a new change initiative anywhere, you're asked to evaluate it in place, despite the fact that probably similar things have been evaluated over and over again, wherever they're done and show the same thing. And so you always have to do your local version of evaluation. So we did ours. Um, we evaluated our three most mature hubs for about an 18 month period. We had one hub in uh, Ealing, one hub in Brent and one hub in Harrow. And um, what we showed was that by providing monthly joint clinics and then monthly paediatric multidisciplinary meetings, we were essentially meeting um, the domains of the quadruple aim of, of healthcare. Um, is it worth explaining what the quadruple aim of healthcare is? It certainly is now you've mentioned it. Yeah, now yes. I've mentioned it, yes. <laughs> yes, so, um, we want to know. Originally, originally came from the um, the triple aim, which was um, developed by the Institute of Healthcare Improvement by Donald Berwick and his team, and um, they said that any high performing healthcare system should seek to do three things: they should improve the health of their population, they should provide a high quality individual experience of care, and they should do that for reduced overall cost or more efficient resource use, and they. The received wisdom was always that you could do two of those at the expense of the other one. Right. So, for example, you could improve the health of your population and you could provide them all with a really high quality experience, but that's obviously really expensive. Or you could improve the health of your population and you could do that for a reduced overall cost, a low cost, but actually your experience of care is going to be really poor. Yeah. So they, they suggested that there was one good way to do all three, and that was to provide integrated care, which will come as... No surprise, <laughs> given the, the, the subject we're talking about. And a few years later, they um, expanded that to the quadruple aim, and they also included staff experience as a really important factor. And then two years ago, they now expanded that to the quintuple aim, and the fifth aim is uh, social justice and inclusion. Right. We evaluated our primary care work, integration work, against the quadruple aim. And you know, just to give you some figures about how how you could suggest we are improving access. I think, first of all, any patient who is seen or discussed at a hub, over two thirds of those will avoid a referral into secondary care. Wow. So uh, whether it's for a first new outpatient appointment or for advice and guidance, they'll avoid that referral in. And the reason for that is you are meeting need much sooner 
it means that they don't have to join a 18 week minimum wait list to be seen in the hospital. And as you know, Jill, as you were talking earlier, you know, some of the, some of our waiting lists at the moment are even longer, even longer than that, you know, sometimes over a year, sometimes approaching two years. Yeah. Um, so if you're able to see and treat need much earlier, then obviously that's better for everyone. We we had a little look at that actually, and I think one of our most one of our most important measures is uh, we looked at the time it took from the family's first presentation to primary care with a problem to to accessing specialist care in a joint clinic supported by primary care, and um, the the median time in that case from first presentation to being seen by a specialist was 30 days so a month and when you're comparing that to you know potential to wait 18 weeks six months a year to be seen for secondary care clinic appointment in some cases then obviously you can see how you've improved access to specialist care and you've met need at a much sooner time point in a um, situation in an environment that is on families' doorsteps in primary care. And you know, as a result, one of the things we wanted to do was, by, by providing this, is that you're promoting trust in primary care, you're strengthening primary care. So we also take qualitative data from um, the families who, who come to the clinic. And I think, I think 100, 100% of the families said that they would recommend the service. But we also asked them if the clinic was improving their trust in in primary care in their local primary care service and uh, across the board that was always the case so um, patients were much more likely to return to primary care if they had a similar problem in the future it just sounds brilliant and simple and I like simply brilliant and (laughs) I'm sure that some of the statistics around prevention early intervention some of the things that to me probably you can't measure in terms of yeah. you know preventing crises further down the line and just helping yes. people, yeah, it's exciting, Tom, and like not yeah. rocket science. It's not rocket science, is it? You know that's the thing. It's funny, isn't it? Because the reality is that um, actually it's not a difficult thing to do. You just have to um, find a time and a place, get the paediatrician and GP to sit in a room and book the patients. So on the face value, it's not. It's not rocket science, but, you know, the, the reality of doing that in a system that's worked a certain way for years and is organised a certain way yes. is, um, as you know, as you're very aware, very complex and takes a lot of perseverance. And it's the work of a lot of people to get that up and functioning in a way that actually has worth and is sustainable. Yeah. But it's, it's absolutely worth doing. I think, you know, it, it, it speaks to a point I often make. You know, I, I, sometimes I go to present this work and people say um, it's a really good project, it's a really good pathway. And I'm always very keen to make the point that it isn't a project, it's not a QI project, it's not an optional extra. Yes. It's a, it's a fundamental change to the way that we organise care. And in fact, it's a new technology. It's a new technology for the way that care is delivered that better meets need at an earlier time point, closer to where the families live and work. Wow. That's so interesting, Tom. And I think you also had some brilliant examples around the other holy grail, which is joining up physical and mental health by bringing some of those professionals together. What are you up to there? Uh, Yeah, so that's a really exciting area of work. You know, I'm not going to pretend that this is well established and has been running. It's really novel. It's very new. And it's something we're just dipping our toes into the water with but I think it's absolutely essential you know to to my mind our collective failure as a society to address the mental health needs of some of our young people is scandalous really yeah yeah I think I think it's scandalous and I think you know people there seems like there's a lot of talk about it in the media but in another way I don't always see signs that we're actively addressing it I know a lot of good work is being done in lots of sectors and the reality is I still every week I still see young people um, turning up in crisis and um, struggling with mental health challenges so you know we we were thinking about what you know what can we do you know I think that um, this is another area where the, the system for very traditional reasons has remained very fragmented and and very siloed 
you know, we talk about primary and secondary integration, you know, that's all largely physical health. So, you know, at least you're in the same book there, but the way um, the system is organized around physical and mental health, my experience is just that there's a gaping chasm between those two things. And um, the funny thing about that is that we have the evidence that that in real life, that's, that's not the case. It's not the case. Those two things are the same and they are absolutely related. There is a Venn diagram there. You know, we know that if you have a long-term chronic condition or in fact, any physical health condition, young people, you know, adults are much, much more proportionally likely to suffer from poor mental health. And the converse is also true. If you suffer from poor mental health, you are much, much more likely to experience a physical health complaint. So those two things are intricately linked. And yet our system is not <laughs> intricately linked. Not at all. <laughs> in a way that can appropriately address that. You know, and, and it, it, goes back to, it goes back to how do you meet need for me? And you know, examples from my own clinical practice. And I know for a fact the, um, the clinical practice of lots of my consultant pediatric colleagues, because we've spoken about this, is that um, you know, in your secondary care clinic, we see huge numbers of young people who will come with physical health complaints that are not wholly explainable through a physical health lens. Right. You can do all the investigations, you can send blood tests, you can do imaging, ultrasounds, x-rays, everything will come back normal. Doesn't always mean to say that there isn't a physical health problem, it just means that we haven't found it on the you know, the limited, reasonably limited number of tests we have and the limited lens that we look through yeah. as, uh, you know, as physical health practitioners. However, lots of the time, it's, it's abundantly clear that there is a, a large overlap between mental health, the spectrum of mental health, and, um, you know, the physical symptoms that that young person has come describing. Very often this plays out as, you know, headaches, tummy aches, aches and pains. Again, it's a spectrum. It's a spectrum. So, you know, the question is, how can I adequately meet that need? There's always a, there's always a, a temptation to say, you know, I know this, this does happen. There's always a temptation to say, well, actually, we've done all the tests and there's nothing wrong with you. So I'm going to discharge you. doesn't really feel very adequate. Most health practitioners in, you know, any discipline, any sector probably went into the NHS to, to help people. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's the medical school answer, isn't it? Why did you want to be a doctor and... I want to be a doctor to help people. But there's something glorious about that, I think. There is something wonderful about that. Absolutely. Yeah, we're going to celebrate that. We, no, we should. We, we shouldn't um, let go of that. So, you know, the question is, how can I help you? You know, I could refer you on to CAMS or, you know, a, one of our voluntary sector primary intervention services, and then they're going to join a waiting list. And actually, I won't see you again. Um, and they'll go over there and they'll say, oh, well, hang on, you've got headaches. Um, that's a physical health problem and very often you see you know young people going round and round in the system yes and of course all the time the key issue isn't being addressed which might be anxiety you know stress something in their home life or their wider environment so as long as that's not being addressed in an appropriate way they can they, they keep coming back so it's not it's not uncommon to see young people pop up time and time again at different parts of the system because the system can only deal with the episode and not the the core need so what we wanted to do is to um, build a, a new clinic that could better meet total need, combined physical and mental health need. Because I, you know, I might have part of the answer as a physical health practitioner, but equally my colleagues in CAMS will, will probably have you know, a, an equally large part of the answer. And there is a, there's a distinct overlap there. So rather than seeing you in separate silos, again, it's not rocket science. We just said, let's just have one space where um, you can be seen by a pediatrician and by a CAMS psychiatrist together. And actually, uh, we, we want to make sure you've got space to properly explore both of that, because if you, you, know, you can't meet need inside a 15 minute appointment, and that way you can much better meet the, the overall need of that patient. Everyone works together. And you know, I always say you've got, you've got three experts in the room. You've got the pediatrician who's, who's the expert in physical health. You've got the um, CAMS psychiatrist who's the expert in mental health. And then you've got the patient who's the expert in them and their condition and their life and how it affects them. So you necessarily need more time. It's very exciting. I've been very lucky and, again, it's not the work of one person. 
this crosses boundaries so it's you need a really you know you need a relational approach to leading that change and there isn't just one person who leads that change as well so um you know very grateful to um lots of my colleagues from both the pediatric department lots of my pediatric uh, management team are fantastic but also the cams team and the wider sector particularly uh you know the, the cam psychiatrists i work with who've really you know really pushed to create that space for the young people and we've just started having our first prototype clinic was actually last week wow okay yeah oh, this is very topical it's very topical it's very topical. super topical <laughs> <laughs> um yeah so we had our we had our first two patients last week it is it's funny because um although it's again it's a very simple initiative it's a very new way of doing things for the nhs it's surprisingly novel yeah and so of course we we want to start small and make sure we we're building on success in a way that is sustainable for the clinic and for you know it has to be sustainable and it and we have to show that it actually has you know a positive impact on the well-being of the young people and it's providing something that's needed but it's, it's really exciting to be doing you know the feedback from the first clinic was fantastic and the young people that we saw there, you really got a sense that, at least in my interpretation, that there, I don't think that there was a space that could have explored their issues in the same way. Yes. That would have, you know, unlocked things for them. Yeah, I could feel that. Yeah, you really needed that joint understanding of both the physical and mental health contribution to the overall picture to be able to say, well, you know, I, to have those conversations in a way that's going to be helpful yeah. for them. And so it's a really exciting venture. And again, you know, I think it, um, it speaks to that idea that, you know, children get less because, you know, we, mental health provision for children, as is very well documented, is absolutely an area in which children get less. If you look at, you know, some of the, some of the data, some of the figures from the NHS, even if you go back as far as the five-year forward view, which is 2014 now, and there was commitment in the five-year for review for all acute hospitals to provide appropriate mental health liaison services for all ages. Right. All age appropriate mental health liaison service. And then um, the system remained committed to that. In the, the long-term plan, so 2019, five years later, they recommitted to that goal. And then every year, there's a group who does audits of uh, mental health care provision. So I think the, the most recent figures I had were from from 2022 and they found that for adult mental health liaison a hundred percent of acute trusts had some form of access to adult mental health liaison and the equivalent figure for young people was 26 percent well so a huge gap between what's yeah. provided uh, for both adults and, and young children and then you know we, we thought how can we how can we start to address that and you know the beauty of providing an integrated clinic isn't just that you get the clinic it starts to form a relationship with our local cams professionals our local cams team of course yeah so if we want to build on that in the future to look towards providing a much more integrated mental health service uh, which is again what's needed and the evidence is there it's very clear you have integrated properly integrated mental health liaison will improve mental health outcomes for young people who are admitted to secondary care with a primary mental health problem you know, across the board, and it's more efficient for the system. So it's the first step in starting to build some of those relationships and, you know, and, and work towards a much more joined up offer there too. Well, Tom, thanks for explaining that so well. I think the fact that you've explained in the way that just ordinary people can relate to, you know, a child with headaches, perhaps with anxiety, how would you get to the bottom of that? Is it an optician issue? Is it just what's causing this ongoing problem <laughs> and the idea of just being kicked out of one service and into another service or not with a waiting list and so on. Now, I'm super excited about it because I've mentioned that I'm doing this work around integrating services for children and families with Midlands Partnership Foundation Trust. And my impression is that they are a super innovative, listening, wanting things to progress service. And it's it's huge. Staffordshire and the area they serve is huge. And even integrating things and joining them up within their own service is a challenge. But I think perhaps there's an extra element going on here that I've discovered by talking to you that I want to feed back to them. 
I'm actually meeting with the chief exec to take the Who's Shoes board game there and show him what we're doing across the trust. Oh, fantastic. But to have you know, extra elements, and that's why I love these conversations, because you just pick up nuggets here, there, everywhere, and throw them out to somebody else and try and create those ripples, which is obviously what I'm trying to do with Who's Shoes. So Fantastic. And, and you've even managed, Tom, to throw in a lovely shout out to Bob Kleber, who's been a previous podcast guest in this series. So that's, that's joining things up as well. Oh, excellent. Um, yeah, you know, we're, we're all standing on the shoulders of giants, aren't we, Jill? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's worth saying that the mental health clinics as well, um, we're not the only people doing this. And you know, like I said, for our integrated primary care clinics, the original idea for um, for joining up those clinics, of course, I, I saw really good practice being done elsewhere. UCH in in London are probably you know one of the national centres of excellence for integrated physical and mental health care and adolescent care, and they have uh, for many years run combined clinics in in such a way. That's it's a slightly different setup again, um, because it's a different time and different place. But the original idea came from actually I I went to um, it was a talk on integrated physical and mental health care. And I saw some of their team who were running those clinics come to talk about it. And I was just struck by what a needs-based initiative that was and how that was absolutely what we should be doing in the current climate. Right. So, you know, you're talking about ripples. You know, you can just see how, like, um, you know, if you're there and you pay attention and, you know, you focus on meeting need, those, those ripples of good practice, you know, they, they, they do spread. They do spread. They are there. It might not always look the same where it lands I guess what I'm always keen to stress is I guess we, we have this thing in the system where we, we really like to attribute good work to groups or to individuals. And uh, very often that gets people say, oh, well done. You've done this brilliant piece of work. But, you know, the best work is never done in isolation. There's no such thing as a sudden bright idea that's going to change the world. True. You know, th- those things are few and far between. You know, it's, it's all a contribution to an iterative change process. And you're always working on the wide network of good work that's come before and which you've seen and which you take something from and which resonates with you. And with both, you know, the integrated care, um, primary, secondary care clinics and the integrated physical and mental health clinics, both of those have borrowed heavily and are indebted to really good work done by really dedicated professionals from a wide, wide network of people. And it's, you know, it's just our next local step in trying to, you know, nudge things forward a little bit there. It's it's been brilliant, Tom, to talk to you in this opening episode of this Universal Healthcare podcast series. I think it's unusual, isn't it, Tom, to start with children and we're acknowledging children get less and we're trying to flip that and make sure that children are higher up the agenda. And I think the way that you've described some of the problems and some of the solutions and the modest typical Tom way that you've built on the work that others are doing and relationships and so on and ripples that's how we're going to go forward I think. Oh, absolutely Jill uh, thank you so much for having me you know uh, as always I'm always really keen to you know say a big thank you because loads of people contribute to this work I often am the one who will end up speaking endlessly about it because it's my stuff and I, I really care about it. I'm really <laughs> passionate about doing it. But if I, you know, if I could end on one note, first of all, it's a thank you for making this the first episode because uh, so often, you know, I see uh, children, young people, babies put to the back of the agenda. So it's lovely to be first for once. So thank you very much. And then my final thing is just to say a huge thank you to anyone who's involved in this work anywhere. I meet with huge amounts of people every day in my working life, um, both clinically and involved in my change work and my leadership work and all of them are you know dedicating to me well thank you tom and keep up the good work thank you so much for, for talking to me today thank you jill it's always a pleasure anytime you know i always love an excuse to talk to you so thank you <laughs> it's really nice thank you so much for listening if you enjoyed this episode it would be fantastic if you would leave a review and a rating, as well as recommending the Wildcard Who Shoes podcast series to anyone who you think might find it interesting. And please subscribe. That way you get to hear when new episodes are available. I have lots more wonderful podcast guests in the pipeline. And don't forget to explore and share previous episodes. So many conversations with amazing people 
who are courageously sharing their stories and experiences across a very wide range of topics. I tweet as whose shoes. Thank you for being on this journey with me and let's hope that together we can make a difference. See you next time. <laughs>